Yes. Do the introduction. Here come people. <laughs> They're all coming in. They can. They can't hear us yet. Some can. There we go. I'm so my little chicks hatching. <laughs> Gonna, Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. We're gonna let everybody join for a minute, Jenny, and then we're actually gonna end up muting and turning video off just because there's gonna be a lot of people and, and doing the presentation. Okay, great. Um, well, as people come in, I'll just be doing that. So if everybody hears me, just to let you know I'm gonna mute and stop video for a lot of you. So don't be surprised. Hopefully, don't be too surprised. Um, so we're going to give just a little bit more because we know more people are showing up. We want to make sure that we start when everybody's here. I mean, some people might join later too, so. True. Yeah. So maybe we should just jump in because we don't have all, as much time as we want to do this giant presentation. Right. Well, we want to welcome everybody. Um, just to know we are recording this because we want people to be able to access this later. So um, feel free to ask questions later on and chat them and just know that it will be recorded. Uh, we want to welcome you all to Coping in Crisis working with anxiety, depression, and addictive behaviors. Uh, and we're all gonna introduce ourselves shortly and, and kind of get into more of an educational bit, talking about each piece of this. We're each gonna take one piece. And then we wanna make sure that we have a lot of time for your questions so that we can get into some of the stuff that you all came here for. Um, so I'll, I'll just start since I'm already talking. Uh, my name is Philip Horner. I use him, his pronouns, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker here in town. And, I uh, focus on working with people around reparative attachment uh, struggles and relationships. So I do that through running groups and I do that in individual therapy. I'll pass it off to Caroline. Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Caroline Scheiber. I'm a licensed psychologist in Boulder. Um, so I specialize in treating mostly teens and adults with depression and anxiety and disordered eating. I also treat individuals with medical conditions, and I'm pretty active in the family law world where I do a lot of mental health evaluations and also provide therapy. And I'm gonna pass it on to Liz. <laughs> Thank you. Hi folks, my name is Liz Collins. I use she, her, hers as pronouns. Um, my practice is called Mountain Psychiatry. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I work with children, adolescents, and adults, and I'm board certified. Um, so I get involved to do psychiatric assessments and manage medications for just about all mental health issues where outpatient psychiatry is appropriate. Nice to meet everybody. Wonderful. Um, so we're going to jump in and, and just so a reminder to everybody, we are going to keep you all muted. Um, and as new people come in, I'll be making sure to do that. Um, so we're going to jump in right away into some of the, the educational pieces. So we make sure you have a lot of time for those questions. All right, Caroline. Okay, why don't you yeah. Take it away. All right, that sounds good. So I'm gonna um, start us off just by talking about um, anxiety and what some uh, basically understanding anxiety during this crisis and also um, in general. You can move on, Philip. Okay, so. Um, I wanted to start us off just with some warning signs so that you are, uh, you know, more alert when you see some, some signals or signs, either in yourself or perhaps in a family member or a child, 
um, that could perhaps um, indicate some symptoms of anxiety. So there's both physical symptoms as well as emotional symptoms. So some of the more common physical symptoms are things like feeling nervous or restless or tense, um, increased heart rate, breathing rapidly or even to the point of hyperventilating, sweating, trembling, feeling weak or tired, um, experiencing gastrointestinal problems, so digestive problems, and also having trouble sleeping. These are sort of like the common um, physical symptoms that people experience um, when they have uh, you know, some, some anxiety issues. The more emotionally focused ones are things like worrying excessively, um, or obsessive thoughts, even to the point of not being able to let them go. Um, predicting the future, mostly, you know, worst case scenarios about bad things that can happen in the future. Trouble concentrating or thinking about the worrisome thought all the time to the point of not being able to, to perhaps even do the things that you need to be doing. Having a sense of impending danger, panic, or doom. Having difficulties controlling the worry. That's really the the key here, where it just feels like out of control, where you're just either jumping from worry to worry or you are um, worrying about one particular thing over and over and over again, and having the urge to avoid things that perhaps trigger anxiety. And, um, and as I'm moving through my part of anxiety, we're going to distinguish a little bit between actually avoiding um, you know, situations that could be threatening versus an unrealistic fear. You can move on, Philip. So some types of anxiety disorders. So probably the most common one is a generalized anxiety disorder, um, which many people you know, have experienced in their lives, such as, and, and that includes persistent and excessive anxiety or worry about activities or events. Um, and that could be even just like things that you do in your routine. And the key here is, is that the worry is out of proportion to the actual circumstance. And it's difficult to control the worry and you may even feel physical symptoms. Um, another one that many people experience is panic disorder. And that is usually tends to be um, very physically oriented. So these are sudden episodes um, of feeling intense anxiety and fear or terror that tends to reach a peak within minutes. And during, during this, these like panic attacks, people feel um, they, they can experience like a shortness of breath or chest pain or rapid and fluttering or pounding heart, like heart palpitations. In fact, many people tend to go to the emergency room because they think that they're suffering a heart attack because it's so physical. But really what it is, it, it is a panic attack. Um, other ones that are common is um, social anxiety, especially in teens. So this is, you know, feeling very self-conscious or concerned or embarrassed in social situations, feeling like people may be judging or criticizing them. And there, and then there are our phobias. So these could be either things like, things like agoraphobia, which is um, specifically a fear um, um, in. Uh, uh, sorry, which, which, which leads to avoiding places or situations that might cause you to panic or make you feel trapped, helpless, or embarrassed. Probably the most common category here is the, um, it's a claustrophobia, which is kind of um, being, being scared to be in, in, in enclosed spaces. And then other types of phobias could be really anything from a needle phobia to um, phobia of blood or heights or um, sometimes dogs or any, any, anything else. And it's often actually um, precedented by a, by a bad event or by a negative event, such as like a dog bite, for instance. I also wanted to, um, to draw attention to the fact that anxiety can be caused by medical conditions, um, such as, you know, um, diabetes or hypertension, something like that. Um, and it can also be substance induced. And Liz will talk a little bit more later on about um, substance induced mental health um, disorders. You can move on. So I wanted to distinguish a little bit between normal levels of anxiety and what we would call in the mental health field um, anxiety disorders. So normal levels of anxiety include things like worrying about the implications of COVID, for instance, which is probably very common right now. And, and people experience financial worries or health-related um, worries or relational issues because it's hard to be you know, to be stuck in, in the house with, with, with our loved ones sometimes for this amount of time. 
Um, another normal, normal level of anxiety would be something like worrying about a realistic stressor or, but it always involves the ability to let go of the worry when appropriate so that it doesn't impact your, your entire life. Um, in other normal levels of anxiety are things like feeling insecure at times in social settings. Again, I would say that's probably a very common one in teens in particular. And then, you know, the ability to be proactive about reducing the anxiety provoking stimulus that you have control over by making plans or planning accordingly, that is very, a very healthy way to, to go about the anxiety. And it's really when, when we are unable to let go of whatever it is that worries us or that provokes anxiety, that is when it becomes more, um, more, more pathological. And so talking about the excessive levels of anxiety, um, really the hallmark is you know, being unable to let go of the worrisome thought, that would be a, a big warning sign. And really the interference with your ability to function in social, relational, or occupational settings. That, that's sort of like, you know, in any, before we as mental health professionals would really diagnose anybody with, a mental, with, a, with an anxiety disorder, for instance, we, we, we would check on that. To what extent does the anxiety actually um, impact your ability to function? And um, another uh, potential warning sign of an excessive level of anxiety would be inappropriate avoiding, avoidance behaviors that are in excess of the actual threat. So specifically now during COVID, um, what are some of the normal levels of anxiety that we see? So certainly many people currently worry about the economic consequences of, of this crisis. Also worrying about getting sick or worrying about loved ones getting sick, especially um, more vulnerable populations such as our elderly. Uh, wanting to avoid crowded places due to fear of infection is also is very much appropriate to what, what we're currently facing. Um, many people choose to reduce social interactions drastically, and that would also be considered normal given the current crisis. And wanting to be extra careful to follow government guidelines is something that's you know, encouraged and also very much appropriate, an appropriate reaction to the current threat. So, some, some coping skills that are helpful um, for, for people that, that do suffer from anxiety to the point that it becomes perhaps um, disabling or, or impacts their daily life. So speaking about the things that worry you can really help reduce the perceived threat because normally in our heads, things become much worse or seem much worse than when we're actually talking out loud to somebody. So this is where you can even sit together with your family and share some of your fears and worries and you may or friends, you know, and you may find that many people even, you know, ha have, have similar worries and that like shared um, um, experience in and of itself can be very therapeutic. Um, exposure to an unrealistically perceived threat is, you know, what research has shown over and over again to really help to, to tell our brain that, that, that the thing that we're so worried about is actually not that threatening. Um, and this is, of course, you know, assuming that what, what, what you're worried about is, is, is not really all that realistic. Creating a worry box is something that can be very helpful, especially for people who find that their sleep is impacted by the amount of um, anxiety or worry that they're feeling. So that basically means that you are, that the things that you keep worrying about, you write it down on a piece of paper, you put it on the worry box, and then you put, you put it in the worry box, and then you put it aside. And you would even dedicate a certain amount of time, perhaps during the day, where you are allowed to worry about the things that you want to worry about that are in your worry box. But then in, during other times, um, you know, that, that would be then the time for you to do other things and not worry. Investigating the evidence point against the worrisome thought can really help you to, um, to explore realistically as to how threatening the situation really is. And having a plan on how to protect yourself from the threat um, is, is, is helpful too, if there is actually something that you need to plan out. Learning to differentiate between the things that you can control and the things that are out of your control and being able to let go of the things that are out of your control. Um, is very helpful. Um, exercise to release some of the excessive energy because really that is what anxiety is. It's just a buildup of energy that's in your body and your body is trying to process it. And exercise is a great way to let go of it. 
And then finally, just an activation of your parasympathetic nervous system, which um, is the part of your nervous system that helps you to feel relaxed and calm and so on. And some ways to activate that, that branch of your nervous system are things like mindfulness, meditation exercises, increasing body temperature by, for instance, you know, taking a warm shower, taking a warm tub, drinking tea, wrapping yourself in a blanket, something like that, that all activates your parasympathetic nervous system. And really anything else that you find calming for yourself. For some people that might be listening to relaxing music, doing art, or, or, or really anything else that's calming. And I'm handing it over to Philip, who will talk about depression. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. And I'll try and do just the same with depression. Um, and so, as you know, we're going through over these few things. So I'm going to go over depression with you. And I wanted to first just name, what does it look like? And I think many of you might have uh, known a friend or experienced some of this on your own. And so I'm just going to go through these common symptoms. Um, and, and one that kind of gets forgotten sometimes is irritability, which can look like anger. Uh, it's really common when people are feeling more depressed, possibly a lack of desire or interest in doing things. Not wanting to get out of bed in the morning, I know this is common for some of us, but this is more the perspective that we will lay there for hours on end. So again, I think Caroline said very well about that some level of anxiety is normal during situations. It can be normal not to want to like get out of bed, maybe it's comfortable but not even wanting to move for several hours is a different thing. Uh, sleeping more than usual, or, gotta love my mouth, sleeping more than usual or trouble sleeping at all. Isolation, so disengaging from activities or events. Uh, lack of energy or feeling more exhaustion. Overeating or possibly having no appetite. And difficulty with concentration, that's more thought of as basic things you'd be doing. So. Yeah, if reading a newspaper, for instance, um, or even watching TV becomes hard, that kind of concentration level, not so much if you're trying to study, that's a little different. Um, so how is this impacted right now? Because a lot of us might think, you know, this is a pandemic we're in, this is kind of a crisis, but we're also thinking of other situations too. So generally, all these symptoms usually will get worse. But particularly, I look at these few when I'm working with people. As isolation, you might be more isolated. Pandemic is forcing it in some ways. Increased level of hopelessness. Uh, I've heard that common more recently as people are feeling worse and worse. And I underline this because the anger and irritation level can really go up. And I think I was talking about this in another group, but we can, might even if we're feeling more depressed, feel snappy with people. That might not be because we're just upset. We might really be feeling pretty depressed. In these cases, a lot of times our routines fall apart, which creates even more difficulty, particularly with depression. Routines are really important to help us get out of that space. Suicide risk increases. So watching for signs of staying in the bed longer or self-harming behavior. Uh, this could be in yourself or others to know that this is really uh, getting bad for you. Uh, loneliness can feel permanent. So this feels like this is the rest of your life. Nothing's gonna change. I'm going to be alone um, and possibly increased use of substances that I know this is going to talk more about social media entertainment so if you find yourself watching Netflix for several days in a row for hours on end this could be indicating something beyond just I'm bored and I want to binge watch a series I threw in this tiny comment uh, comic because I, I thought it really highlights the, one of the difficulties with actually depression because with depression we have to somehow create motivation and in this you can see uh, this this uh, person trying to find motivation and uh, looking for it and so where did it go when we're feeling depressed our friends are feeling depressed we have no motivation usually to change things uh, and without that things feel really impossible the simplest things like getting out of your bed, going outside, seeing friends, it seems like the hardest thing. So if we all were able to practice some of these basic things at the bottom that I have listed, quality sleep, mindful activities that Caroline talked about, eating well, I know that's subjective, but eating better than maybe usual, exercising, a lot of us probably would feel better, but it create we need motivation to do a lot of these things. So that in itself is hard. So Sometimes we try and look and figure out what's blocking us from this. Um, and we know that 
practicing this over and over is really important, the skills I'm going to go over in a second. And we have to also realize that it's never going to be perfect. We have to give some compassion to ourselves. So I want to name that before we walk into this next spot. So these are all possible skills that I found really helpful for people when they're in a depressed spot to help them create motivation and get out of it. Like I said in the last slide, if you can do those four things, and probably others, socialize too, I didn't put on there, um, you probably will start to feel better. I've seen it in many people I work with and, and even colleagues and friends that when they start doing those things, they start feeling better. But how do we do that? And so I've just listed out some things, and I even named where some of them are coming from so you can look them up a bit more, but I'm going to briefly touch on them because some of these I could spend five minutes to an hour on with each of you. But one mindfulness is a DBT technique, and the idea with it is we're focused on one activity, and that's it. And so I encourage people with this, particularly in mornings. If we're trying to create a new routine, you're feeling depressed, we know when we wake up, what we want to do is we want to go exercise. Let's just say that's an example. And so in order to do that, when we're doing that, all we're thinking about is how we want to stay in bed and how I want to answer that email or how I just want to play a video game or whatever it might be. That's everything but what we're trying to focus on. So one mindfulness is the idea of continuing our focus on one thing at a time. And when those things come in, I tell people to mentalize it. Oh, I'm noticing distraction. Okay, I'll, I'll look at you later. Oh, okay, back to getting my running shoes on. Oh, emails. Nope, I'll think about you later. Thank you. We're mentalizing that these thoughts are coming up. The other piece I like is creating smaller goals. If you are really depressed, and let's say you're stuck on your couch, or this could be for your friends or family, and you can't get off the couch because all you're thinking about is like, well, I've been told I need to go exercise. Well, that means I have to get my running shoes on and I have to go to the right place and all of that. Well, why don't we start with, let's see if we can just get outside even in our pajamas. So let's make small goals. And then we get out there. Maybe then we're like, you know, I'm going to go put those running shoes on after all. Large ones make things really hard sometimes. Opposite action is another DBT skill that was actually invented for anxiety. But in some ways, it is exactly, I take it literal. If, you, if your action is, and you're feeling depressed, I want to go lay in my bed, good idea is to do the opposite thing in that moment. Particularly if you know, you're aware, and that's not going to be helpful for you. Oh, that might mean you want to go outside. So it's, it's giving us a chance to make an active choice. It's where you're conscious of what's happening. And so no longer are we making automatic choices. We're stopping and thinking like, oh, I could go lay in my bed, but I know I'm not going to feel any different. Uh, but I really want to lay in my bed. But I could make a different choice right now. I could go outside. And so it's a very hard practice. And the last two are about making routines and planning for those days ahead, when, particularly when you have nothing to do. Because those are really easy days for you, your children, for your friends to lay around, do nothing, feel worse. So planning, scheduling things, having a list already created of things you can do when you're sitting there thinking, what do I do right now? Um, and that includes creating routines for the morning and night. This is a, a resource list we want to provide to you. As you all know, we're going to put this up so you all can have it. We're either going to put it in the chat or uh, find another way to get it to you. But these are just resources in our area and, and, and nationally, too. Some support groups in case you are looking for a few community groups. Uh, I'm the director of Whole Connection. We offer one. Umbrella Collective does one for healthcare workers. Uh, Caroline does an anxiety group, um, and we wanted to make sure that the suicide hotline and everything is there too if you do are worried about people. And some of this is for local area we are in Boulder. And then obviously if therapy is always useful, um, we're all part of Boulder Psychological Services, you always can reach out there. And then DBT skills groups, uh, good colleagues of mine run one here nationally too, and, and they are wonderful for when you're in a depressed place. So I'm going to pass this off to Liz. I think this is uh, her first slide, um, and <laughs> let her take it away. Is this you? This is, I think? This is, one, this is one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this wonderful. is uh, Calvin. Was... Calvin takes a bath, which just you know, if you feel like it's hard and messy right now, it's probably because it's hard and messy. Um, so hi everybody, um, Philip. If you will go to the next slide. So again, my name is Liz Collins. Um, I use she, her, hers. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner 
and my practice is called Mountain Psychiatry. Um, I, I come to the field of prescribing from a, maybe a different place from some of my colleagues. Um, I worked for more than a decade in wilderness therapy. Um, so I was a drug and alcohol counselor for uh, about 15 years and have a lot of respect for um, harm reduction, motivational interviewing, the role of therapy, and doing things other than starting folks on psychiatric meds. So we're, we're gonna get into that. So Philip, if you go to the next slide. Um, what we're gonna cover, just briefly, we're gonna talk about how we as humans develop substance use. Most of us know it's, it's not an issue of willpower and it's not just about getting high. Um, we're gonna talk about where the line is and the criteria is for a substance use problem um, and how you can help yourself and your loved ones avoid uh, sliding down the hill with that and some treatment resources. So, how, how does it happen? Like with most areas of science, we're, we're still learning, um, but we've got a pretty good handle on, on the gist of it. Um, when we as humans grow up in families, we learn how to cope with stuff. I, I'm sure that most of us have caught ourselves acting or saying something that our parents said, um, maybe you know, either in delight or embarrassment kind of seeing some of those similarities. So we, we catch a lot of the patterns from them. Is there genetic support? Sure, of course there is, but is it gonna be easy to tease out you know, from, from what happens in family patterns? Not necessarily. So we've got, we've got a, lot of, a lot of different factors. Um, trauma it plays a really, really large role. And um, what, we, what we've seen is that trauma can create a tremendous amount of stress. Please keep in mind, a lot, of, a lot of patients who see myself or see Philip or Caroline uh, will say, oh, you know, it wasn't trauma. Um, I just, I wasn't raped. I didn't go to war. Um, my dad was just angry. Yeah, he was scary. Yeah, he would rage. Um, my mom was distant. My mom was drunk. Um, you know, my uncle was allowed to grab my ass when I walked through the living room. So, uh, it, it doesn't have to be violence. It doesn't have to leave marks. And actually what we see is that when trauma doesn't leave marks and bruises, that can actually be more insidious and that might be a different conversation. Um, but in general, the presence of childhood adverse experiences has a really, really high correlation with substance use and with most mental health issues. Um, if you get rescued, if you have somebody in your life who says, hey, this is not okay, that plays a pretty large role. Um, the ability to tolerate uh, distress and uncomfortable emotions um, is, it has a, a large factor in whether or not folks develop substance use because substances are really good at helping us not be present with what sucks. So if, uh, if we don't know how to do that, there's going to be a really, really large hole that substances can, can fill the, the place of in helping us feel better, at least for the time. So I hope that we're all thinking about right now with all of this, are we stressed? Um, are we getting the support that we need? Is your child stressed, angry, upset? Could they maybe benefit from? We'll go to the next slide. So... Um, I'm going to let you guys just kind of look this over for a minute. The gist is that substance use disorders, if they are caught, um, or I should say that differently, if they get the attention that is deserved and the substance use symptoms uh, show up in front of a healthcare professional, it's identified and um, diagnosed if it's starting to interfere with functioning. So interfering with role obligations, disrupting relationships, putting someone's health, sleep, mood, et cetera, uh, in harm's way. So the next slide is um, a bit of a bummer for, for some folks. Uh, usually, usually people are surprised to learn this. So the CDC and pretty much any medical agency and association is gonna follow this standard. Um, 
alcohol when we're when we're having one to two drinks, one for a female, two for for folks that uh, birth at gender at birth was uh, was male, then that's regarded as moderate drinking. Heavy drinks is only eight drinks a week for me. So a lot of us are using more substances right now. A lot of us have more time on our hand. We're home more. We're not going to the gym. We're not doing some of this stuff. Um, so folks are using more. Binge drinking is identified when um, females are drinking four or more drinks and males five or more in a setting. So a lot of people will easily achieve that at a, a holiday party, at a wedding, etc. cetera. Um, and every time someone does this, it's got an association with damage to the pancreas, the liver, uh, various cancers, accidents, trauma, social problems, other things like that. So how do we reduce substance use? Um, I'm going to be approaching most of this from a harm reduction place. And again, my view is that, and, and most mental health care providers view is going to be that substance use is a, a method or something that folks use to cope with uncomfortable emotions, memories, sensations, uh, social anxiety, boredom, etc. And for most folks, we can, we can improve and reduce the severity or the problems of mild to moderate use. Please don't confuse uh, mild to moderate drinking with a mild to moderate substance use disorder, but that we can, we can improve uh, how folks are doing and the severity of that by bringing in other healthier habits. So some gold standards are exercise, and it's so fortunate that the timing was that Caroline and Philip went before me because they've already done the heavy lifting. Anything that's gonna treat stress, anxiety, and depression is often, not always, but often going to be correlated with lower use. And now, of course, there are some substances where this may not apply. If someone has a dependency on alcohol, on opioids, on other things like that, it's gonna be a little bit harder to interrupt and slow down, but it, it, it does work and it can be part of, of treatment. So the World Health Organization, um, myself, and again, most health agencies are gonna recommend at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity. You're sweaty, you're not saying this many words per breath because you gotta stop and you gotta take a breath, right? So you're sweaty, your cheeks are flushed if you're of Caucasian descent like me. Um, you want to have at least two of those be strength training or resistance training. If you're new to this, please be careful. Take care of your knees and your ankles. Social engagement. Um, this is hard right now. If, if you can, uh, if it feels appropriate to see people in person, um, in a backyard, in a front yard, um, walk you know, on the grass while they walk on the sidewalk, any of that is helpful. Therapy, um, if you're already doing it, consider adding skills, consider adding a group. Philip just named a number of, of great ones. And Caroline also had a number of really good resources. You can do skills training, there's equine therapy, there's art therapy, there's a lot of things that are still happening that are, are really great resources. Um, and if you are having problems with sleep, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, is the best treatment that we have available. It beats any prescribed sleep aid, period. Uh, the makers of Ambien got themselves into a bit of a situation where they, they, had a, um, they had a study that was going that they didn't publish because the results were so embarrassing to them. So CBTI is a great thing. Um, and I, I typically recommend that folks, you know, if, if you're doing well, if things are generally okay, but you don't have exercise, you don't have a therapist, you don't have some of these other things, now's a really good time to do that because storm clouds exist. It may not be above your head, but stuff is going to hit the fan. If it's calm right now, we know that well, things can always get harder. So it's a good time to buff up. Um, so the next one is just obviously if we can try to prevent some of the causal factors in our, in our children um, and in our family members or support them, get them treatment. That's going to be really beneficial. Um, one of the best things that you can do is try to be protective 
of, uh, of childhood trauma and adverse experiences and get folks the care that they need. If you're a parent and you, you have kids and again, they're seeming irritable, they're seeming upset, despondent, not doing well, connect them with a professional in that area. I, I love primary care providers and pediatricians, but we have so many excellent, very highly competent and skilled healthcare providers who are in mental health specialties. I'm happy to for free give folks referrals to folks that I know that are highly skilled, licensed, and competent in that area. Um, I know that BPS also is happy to do an assessment and connect folks with providers. Um, so get them, get them connected because I've seen some of the challenges that can happen if folks don't get care. Um, speaking to this also is just that, you know, the dollar, uh, the cost benefit um, ratio for treatment and early intervention compared to treatment if we wait is incredible. And if you've ever had to send a child to wilderness therapy or residential treatment, you have seen that firsthand. So earlier intervention is recommended. Um, please keep in mind that one of the greatest ways to increase risk for kids is early use, low supervision and access. So um, it's not a good idea to connect kids with substance use. It's not, a, it's not recommended to uh, be tolerant or condoning alcohol use, cannabis use, et cetera, um, for adolescents. Follow, follow what the law says. Uh, there is no healthy amount of alcohol for kids. Um, and most, most substance use issues, um, let me say that differently. Most prescription misuse disorders start because folks get uh, a pill from a friend, a friend's parent, um, and that might be allowed, that might be sanctioned, that might be sold, et cetera. So I do recommend that folks get a lockbox for medications, especially if you have opioids, stimulants, benzos, et cetera. Um, and if you have meds that you don't need are expired, you had a surgery last year and you've got oxy just floating in your medicine cabinet, get rid of it. And please don't flush it, don't put it in the trash. Safe, safe disposal is something that you can Google. Um, I know that the Genoa Pharmacy has safe disposal, the Sheriff's Department, the CU Police Department on campus. Uh, there's a number of other ones, so you can just Google the term safe disposal and you just drop it in what looks like a mailbox. And the last slide is there's a lot of great resources in the area. Therapists, um, Boulder County Alcoholics Anonymous has meetings every day for, um, they have closed meetings, open meetings, young meetings, LBG, G, LBGTQ, um, for men, for women, for others. Out Boulder has weekly AA meetings um, and a fellowship meeting. The Phoenix is a really cool sober activity community. Um, so they are folks who purely don't use and they do activities all the time. It's really awesome. They've got like weightlifting and yoga and rock climbing and cycling and all this other stuff. Um, if you ever need therapeutic consultation, Healing Roots is one and there's a number of other therapeutic consultants if you do need to get some help or a higher level of care for a loved one. Um, we've got a number of in and inpatient and outpatient programs in the area. And then of course we have some uh, national and federal agencies that have a lot of great resources. So that is the end of mine. Think, do we have some questions now? Yes, there we go. We wanted to open it up to questions and we're going to have it in the chat box, but um, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask one. Um, we are happy to provide all this. We're going to give this out. I'm going to load it up in a second. Uh, so please feel free to chat some questions. If none come up, we have a lot of common questions. We will also answer that we think are pretty important too. So we'll just give a sec. Feel free to chat them or jump in. Yeah, Jenny. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Sure. Um, other people will, will do it. 
better than I will, but basically it's behavioral interventions to help folks relax um, and set themselves up for, for sleep. So I'll just review like a few uh, bullet points. Um, it often is going to ask folks to have some type of exercise and activity, right? Stagnation or folks just being in the same place all day is not going to, not going to set themselves up. You want to restrict the window for sleep. So if you're having a hard time sleeping, it's broken. Um, you're not, you're sleeping in chunks. You're having a hard time falling asleep. You wake up, you get up earlier than you want. Your window's too big. You need to, you need to sink it in. So, um, for example, if you're only getting a total of six hours, a provider might ask you to, uh, you know, you start to get sleepy around 10, maybe wait until 11. Truly try to kind of keep yourself out of your bed until then, and then get yourself up at a regular time. Um, the bed is only used for sleep and sex. It's not a place where folks are recommended. If you have a TV and you've got problems sleeping, you, need, you really need to get that out of there. That's going to be the, one of the first things that's asked to do. And really, all that other stuff that folks like to do in, their, in a comfortable bed needs to be done elsewhere. And you can still do it. You can watch all the reruns of Golden Girls, Sex and City, whatever you're into. Um, but you just need to do it from a couch. You need to do it from a place where your brain doesn't understand that you're supposed to be sleeping. Uh, you get away from screens, you know, 60, 90 minutes beforehand. Those are some of the basic tenants. You can go to my website and find under sleep. Uh, there's a, a number of tenants and a really good book for, for sleep, but there's an, also a number of providers in the area that do CBTI. And it's, and it's brief. It's not, you don't have to do it for years. It's not psychoanalysis. You do like six weeks and then, and then you're, you're done. Yeah, if I um, that that was a great explanation. Is if I can time in, I'm actually I'm, I am actually trained in CBTI. And, yes, I'm. Uh, sorry, I forgot that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean I think you you explained it great. Um, and and yeah, I I think this is the great thing about CBTI is that it's very structured. It's very behavioral oriented. It's also so it, it a lot of I think what what Liz was um, kind of touching on is about the association with um, the bed only being there for sleep rather than really anything else. And we know, especially for our teens nowadays, they're doing, and also, you know, us adults are, are kind of guilty of that too, doing all these different things um, in bed, you know, being watching Netflix or being on our phones and all of that. And, and it's just, um, you know, research has really shown that if our brain learns to associate the bed with nothing but sleep, it helps it, it it helps that you know when we actually go to bed we fall asleep and that that also means that when you cannot fall asleep at night you're supposed to get out of bed and you're supposed to you know do whatever you want to do then um you know in a different place in the house like on the couch or something like that it's also about changing your thoughts around sleep because when people have had a long um you know like long long long-term issues with sleep it's almost like they they develop an anxiety around going going to bed and sleeping and so that that's what your cbti therapist will help you with also and then and then finally what i what i want to add is also about triggering the melatonin release and so you do that by for instance um you know keeping your room dark and cool um and you know quiet um all these kind of things have really shown to help the, the melatonin release and, and also as, as, as Liz was saying, having kind of like a, a regular sleep schedule where you especially wake up at the same time, no matter whether it's you know during the week or the weekend. And that becomes so important, I think, right now during COVID because you know we don't have too many responsibilities. We have less responsibilities now than we normally have. And so it triggers us to, to just stay in bed, especially when we couldn't sleep, but that's when you actually wanna get up um, so that way you are tired then the, the following evening. Yeah, and actually, and I, I don't know what, what you think, Liz, but, but I think um, it's the research that has shown that actually CBT in conjunction maybe even with a, with a, a medication can be very helpful for those um, who have really chronic sleep issues. It, CBTI beats meds. Okay. That's just what we, I mean, we, we can use meds because sometimes, you know, someone is going to have a hard time showing up and their will, their trust that, that that's going to work is limited. So sometimes I, I, I prescribe things like trazodone and, and non, uh, non 
controlled hypnotics like trazodone or an antihistamine all the time. Um, but you know, it once once folks get into that pattern and they're feeling better. Um, yeah. You know, because typically people, if if they're not sleeping well, they feel like garbage emotionally. Right. They're anxious, depressed. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 Of course, Jeannie. Thank you for the question. Anyone else have questions? We want to make sure to give you space before we answer some common ones we know that uh, come up. Oh, I got one. Does Myla have a sister? Was that a question? Yeah, does Myla have a sister? Myla does. does... For an adoption. <laughs> Myla does not have a sister. All right. Well, that's funny. You guys, Philip uh, has an amazing, amazing dog, which is yes. featured right now. Yes, so if you all see behind me, I have a dog who's uh, trained to be a therapy dog. So that she comes in with a lot of my clients. And I cannot say uh, enough about how uh, actually animals are amazing for therapy purposes. And so equine work is pretty amazing too. Um, I, I, on that state, I was just thinking about one of the common questions is I think about a lot is is there a limit of pushing your kid to doing healthier things? And how does that look? Um, and this comes up a lot because I work with families quite a bit. And the families are always asking like, well, we want them to do this and we're telling them to do this and it's not working. And it, 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 there is this delicate line where we want to support uh, people doing healthy things and set our limits and boundaries as a team. Uh, and so what I would name, and I'm gonna hand this off to my colleagues too, as a really important thing, is modeling this is really important, not forcing but creating opportunities for it. And so that might be how you eat, uh, creating the sleep times that could be exercising and letting it be seen. Um, children particularly will pick up a lot from behaviors they learn at home a lot of times. Uh, and so a good modeling experience. But I, I think this is an important one because we're trying to think of how to do those healthy things that help us out of a lot of these difficulties. I, I heard from all three of us the same thing over and over. We need to get better sleep, exercise, eat well. And so this is one, I think it's an important question, but I'm gonna pass it off to you too if you have more on this. Go ahead, Caroline, if you do. I'm, I'm currently trying to figure out how to share the presentation with everybody because I think that would be good for people to go back to us. I'm sorry, I was a little distracted. So if you, if you, wanna, if you wanna go first, Liz, I'll... Um, no, I, yeah. think, I think you guys have covered it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard stuff. Sometimes just, you know, putting the shoes on and buying yeah. the, the, you know, cruciferous crunch and the cabbage and the, you know, the poblano peppers and the other things that that's sometimes just the hardest part to set up. It's hard. And yeah. I think we're all, we're all doing the best, the best that we can. Um, and I think all of us deserve really good support. Life is, life is hard, even in good circumstances. And these, this is a strange experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We really want to give you all space. So please feel free to ask a uh, message either of us. Oh, this is a good question. How, so I'm just going to name them out loud. How can I support my family when we are all feeling anxious during these uncertain times? And this, this is a really tricky one because we're trying to control our own anxiety. We're trying to model, create, and hold space for our family, our kids, while at the same time we are struggling. I think us as therapists and mental health practitioners of all types are trying to figure this one out too. Um, because in doing so, we have to make sure that we're doing extra care so that we can care for the people we're trying to do our work for. And so when we're feeling anxious, practicing the same things, but naming it, I think in that aspect, the mentalizing task is really important with the family, but particularly if you have a partner or even your children, I think the vulnerability sometimes to some extent can be really important for your, parents, your kids to know that other people can struggle with this too. It's again, a modeling perspective for them to know that it's okay for them to feel anxious and they can come talk to you about it and work with it. Um, but I like this because this is real. I, I imagine many of you are feeling a bit anxious during this time. I know I've had anxious moments. I imagine my colleagues have. Um, so this is an important one to think about. 
And Caroline, Liz, feel free to chime in on these questions if, if any of them. Yeah, so I just, I, I also just wanted to check. I, I just was able to send the PowerPoint presentation to everyone. So I, so you, oh. should, you should see this in your, in your chat. So I think that's probably helpful oh, yeah. that's for the there. resources and everything. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so, so yeah. Please download that. Yeah, and, and, and so Philip, I'm sorry, because I was distracted with you. The question was, that was sent to me, was how can I best support my family when you're all feeling anxious during these uncertain times? Yeah, well, I mean, and, and I'm sorry if, I re if I'm repeating now something that you might have already said, but I think, yeah, the, the keeping the conversation going, I think, especially for your teens too, and, and actually realizing or recognizing that you know we are really all in a very similar boat right now and we're probably having very similar experiences and i think that there's something um, very therapeutic in the shared experience and so um and you as a parent you know you may want to model that for your for your kids by actually you know describing how you have been feeling and you can do this too and and because that way they may they may see that and they adopt that and they'll be like oh wow yeah i've been feeling that way too because for them it's a lot harder to name their feelings and their experiences than it is, you know, typically for us adults. Um, and, and the same too with like healthy coping, um, coping strategies, you know, whatever it is that we can do during, during these times, be it going for a walk or, um, you know, waking up at a reasonable time, things like that. You can, you can model that, but it, but I think the important part here too is, is to actually say it too, because they may not make the same connections that 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 you're making automatically or that we as adults are making automatically so for your kids really talking your thought process mm -hmm. out loud is very helpful so even something like oh i really didn't feel like going for a walk at all but i'm so glad i did because i feel much better now and your kids are gonna you know absorb that and they'll be like oh okay so maybe you know next time when i don't feel like going for a walk i might want to try it anyway <laughs> because maybe i'll have the same experience as mom um for instance. Yeah. yeah. And again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat, we'll get to them or just send them to one of us privately. Uh, but that kind of leans into the other question, which I think is very important to answer here because this uh, might come up for some of you or you've seen it before and I hope you haven't had to, uh, but about self-harming behaviors and friends, family, or even children. Like if you start noticing them, what do you do? The very first thing I'd say is, uh, it depends on the self-harming behavior, but I would immediately find a therapist. I wouldn't be even a question of mine, but if it starts to feel too risky, there are crisis numbers and so forth that I would call for immediate advice on that to de determine what that is. It really determines what kind of self-harming are we talking about, and they really can provide more information. So the slides that we sent do have that information of numbers you can call. but. I would, at first, without knowing much about what that behavior might look like, find a therapist, even consult with someone to talk what is going on uh, and, and start understanding. Most likely there, uh, there's a lot of reasons people do self-harm. And so we want to just make sure that without knowing about it, we can at least learn as much and do something quickly because it can lead to a pretty bad road fast. I have plenty of clients that have had self-harm behaviors and we quickly try to adjust it and change things in our own work so that we can uh, neglect, uh, change that and, and offer other ways to deal with that kind of feeling. And I would offer also just in my work with kids, um, it, it can be complicated and there's a lot of reasons why parents don't and I respect it. But if you have a young person, if you have a minor threatening suicide, take them seriously. Don't yes. don't say, oh, well, you know, they like to say this, et cetera, for a few reasons there will be a time where people are wrong and someone was very serious. Um, even when folks have a history of, of making statements like that, um, it's incredibly beneficial to demonstrate to kids that you take them seriously and that their words matter. Um, both in, you know, if they're trying to get their needs met in ways that maybe are not so sophisticated, I'm not using the word manipulating. Um, and if they're, um, if there are harm, you know, issues, uh, that's a, it's a, it's a good intervention sometimes that w really can redirect, uh, redirect a pattern and help get kids folk connected to 
healthcare providers. Yeah, for whatever reason, if someone says that, take it. I agree completely. I just want to back up this on this. That it could be because they need more attention in some way. Great, give them more attention. It could be because this is serious. They feel very depressed. Great, give them more attention. It needs to be addressed. And that's why those numbers are there for you. Yeah. I think Faith, that, question. Um, I, I, I'm I, just a, Bridget is my name. Yeah. Um, I, it's just easier than writing in the chat. Sure. So uh, about that, um, it, kids saying that, you know, like making threats in places of being angry. So you like my strategy when my son's done that has been to like immediately stop and say no we're you know that's horrible we're not talking about that you know your life is very precious and and we love you and you know sort of like zone right in but 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 my husband was sort of thinking that's like an attention um strategy so that I or he so that one of us like pays attention to him. So is there, is there like a bad reinforcement that I'm doing by like, he says this and then I, and then I suddenly jump, you know, like I'm very present or, or is that like what Liz was saying? That's actually, you can't, you can't do it. Sounds it. Like a, it sounds like an opportunity to get somebody involved um and so if can, may, may i ask a few questions yeah how old are we talking um 10. okay yeah and is he connected to somebody does he have a therapist mm -mm. okay so we've got a, a 10 year old making a statement that they want to die it sounds like a mm -hmm. really really good time if i'm hearing it correctly this sounds like the right time to get them connected to mm -hmm. somebody because that's quite a statement yeah. mm -hmm. for a 10 year old to even consider and it sounds like there's something going on and i agree with your husband's concern right we want we don't want to reinforce you know what sometimes is labeled as maladaptive behaviors or manipulation or attention seeking etc mm -hmm. what i what we find is that often kids will pursue avenues that they think are going to work um, and, and again, a, a lot of kids who say that something like that, they, they really are needing yeah. more support. Um, and it can help reduce the tension in the home um, if he is connected with somebody. Because I, I would gander that there's probably other behaviors that are troublesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it always yeah. happens when he's like really angry oh, yeah sure oh, yeah, of course yeah he he wants to get out of something or you know he's upset because yeah. something there's a consequence or a limit being said right and it's very self-esteem driven like if we've criticized him you know right, like you right. didn't do this job or something right. so his resiliency his ability to tolerate that criticism or that failure at something else is, is is pretty pretty painful pretty limited and if he gets the support in a more healthy way, a more pro-social, adaptive way, he's more likely to pursue that and come to you, for example, instead of you know, throwing a fit or doing something else that might be labeled like that, coming to you and saying, mom, I'm having a really hard time, can we talk? Or you know, pursuing it in a way that looks better to dad, looks better to you, feels better, doesn't feel so chaotic. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I think you're at a great time to, to help connect him and I'd be happy to talk with you privately at another time to kind of give you some names or you can, you know, contact BPS for, for some mm -hmm. We have a lot of great folks. Oh, good. Thanks. And I think just to add one thing um, here too, and Liz, you know, was already touching on it. I think no matter, you know, what, I mean, he's definitely trying to say that he's suffering and that something right. is going on and that's, and that's, you know, really whether, um, whether this is actually what he's thinking or whether he doesn't have words to express himself differently, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is that, you know, something is up, he's suffering and, and that's his way to, I think, ask for 
help or you know call your attention to it and so um you know and and, and you are listening and so and 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 you're providing the help perhaps you know by connecting him with a with a professional mm -hmm. and the only last thing i'd say bridget is that uh, parenting first of all i like to say is an impossible job there's no way to do it perfectly and so I, I say that not just uh, to name the thing that I think you've probably figured out already, but also that uh, what, you, what you've said isn't like a horrible wrong thing. You are doing a great thing by coming here and asking this question and yeah. trying to mm -hmm. seek support. And, um, and so when I say that you know, individual therapy is always useful, I also think the idea of getting the family involved. And the reason I say that is not because there's a family like there's a problem with the parenting at all, but, but it's really important for the kid to have a voice in the family and see what else can be done there to support them. Sometimes it's not just the individual and so or the 10 year old in this case, that there's other things that can be shifted that are really supportive. And, and I found that the families I get to work with and the, some usually teens, uh, young adults I work with, in those cases, uh, the parents are amazing. They want to do whatever they can and as soon as they know that this is impossible, they're doing all they can, and they make those little shifts, and the kids start repairing, and they start connecting, things like what you're talking about really shift a lot. So, it's amazing to see. Yeah. And nobody teaches us how to do this shit. No. Like, oh my god! Like, yeah. you know, nobody. And if and you know, a lot of us might have some complaints about the families that we were raised in. I sure as do. I'm gonna need a lot of help in parenting um and so you know i want to also normalize like i think you and most folks are doing the best that they can and it, it is like philip was saying it's really rewarding to be in the room or be in the family or be a, a, a contact and witness some of those changes because the chaos comes that comes down the intimacy and the peace comes up and it's just and you know parents feel better about things and kids are doing better they do better in school they pick better relationships they go farther in school it's it's pretty well so mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. yeah thank you for asking okay well thanks for addressing that yeah, yeah. hope that helps though i know we're we're a little over our time but we also started a little late so we wanted to go over but um is there any last thoughts, even if it's just a thought that we want people to have? And if not, and it comes up later, you do have all our emails and even some of our work numbers. I think everybody's work number. Um, so you can reach out to us. And BPS, you can always reach out to. And uh, if you need more or want more. Um, I see anything pop up. So I will say personally, I'll let Caroline and Liz say from themselves. It was really nice being able to present this with you all, um, and I hope it does help. And if you have more questions, please follow up. I would be happy to talk with many of you. This is a really difficult time, and I'm so grateful that many of you showed up. Um, so thank you. I'll just pass off if either of you want to say any last words. Yeah, I, you know, just same, same, same thoughts. You know, thank you all so much for spending your your evening with us. This has been um, a pleasure. And yes, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions to any of us or to BPS. Um, and we'll be happy, happy to either you know meet with you directly or, or provide appropriate referrals. We are all very well connected in the community. And, um, and I hope you all received the PowerPoint and can refer back to that too. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your interest and time. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. Hope everyone has a good night. <laughs>